this is looking south toward uh, Guatemala, Honduras, but you can see like the coastal plain and these waffle hills, and this is where the, the Mayan uh, land is, and they're farming. It's much better soils than, than a lot of what was on ours. We're on like the between the Maya Mountains and the coastal plain, and um, it's it's really beautiful. There's there's 13 hills with Mayan temples on them, with cacao planted all around it. And, uh, it used to be, uh, we got hit by a tremendous hurricane, and uh, but I'll get to that in a minute. The, so what, in order to try to create the diversity that I was after, uh, to mimic, to create analogs to the natural system, and in order to keep growing the crops that were traditionally grown, and some of them are corn in this case, you can see that maybe a one and a half acre, two acre field. What I was doing in the early years was working with some of the local guys that were going to be there when I was gone because I was farming up in Ohio when I wasn't down there in the winter. So I'd do four months down there and eight months up here. And so what I was doing was uh, looking at what the, what the system could do without any inputs. No fertilizers, nothing. Just hand tools uh, and, and elbow grease. And that's that 50, it's, it's 50th of a calorie into one coming out, but it's all hard work. You know, it's not like sitting on a big tractor with an air conditioned cab and burning, you know, 20 calories to one and thinking, well, because we can afford it, because the fuel, the diesel is cheap enough to make that economic system work for a while. Um, then, um, so it was, it was very challenging that way. But you can see where the, back here, that's all permanent forested mature polyculture with with lots of species of, of crops in it, cacao, cacao and coffee and ginger and avocados, and mangoes, uh, lots of medicinals and, and uh, you know, so that's, that's the mature part. But what's interesting is I had 20 of these blocks, I'd do a 20 year rotation, so I wouldn't come back to a crop until 20 years, but it's, it's young forest by then. Uh, but the forest has brought nutrients back up to the surface um, through its roots, like basically it's like a perennial cover crop, right? And so, um, but what's, what's interesting is each year, so there's one through 20 years of regrowth. So I'm standing here taking the picture. This was the, this was the year previous, and you can see the vegetation is, is all, I mean, there's still some papayas and some, a few crops left over that not fully abandoned, um, you know, some plantain and, and chili peppers and whatnot. Um, but by the time, so then you're gonna have you know, one year, two year, then there's three, four, or up to 20. And they're interfacing the edges of the mature forest. So these edges are where it's all going on. Well, I think there's a slide later that's showing about the edge effect people are probably familiar with where you get this big bump in biodiversity when uh, edges of, of different types come together, uh, age, uh, so these are serial stages, and so when you're managing for this many different stages, you got uh, much more levels of diversity than um, you would generally find in, a, in a, just a solid block of forest. I when I was working in the Wayne National Forest uh, doing bird surveys, when I woke up in, you know, at my, in the morning in my house with the gardens and the you know, got North Slope Woods behind me, and I've got South Slope Woods on the other side of the valley, I've got a stream running through it, I've got fruit trees and gardens and all this stuff. I had more species in when I woke up in the morning than any of the old growth forests that I went into. Um, they were slightly different species, but the, uh, the overall diversity was, um, is very impressive in a human managed system. So let's see what else on that. Uh, so we would make these bush camps. This is a second year again. So after the rice and corn and squash and beans and that kind of thing, there'd be uh, these plantains and these are sweet potatoes in between them with a living mulch and then a little bush camp where we'd stack the corn and the uh, other, some of the other crops, but oh, must have taken that slide out. Well, this is another shot of cacao underneath of a, of a canopy. And so this will be a tropical analog to some of the things we'll look at for like around here and uh, what our options are. Oh, so this is the bush camp. So you see the corn and the sesame. Uh, sesame dries, you know, when it dries, it opens from the top. So you can hang it upside down, it'll come out. But you can stack it like that and it'll all dry. And then you just turn it upside down. They just fall out like coins out of a tube of coins. But so this was a baby hanging in the shade while we were picking chilies and uh, such. 
uh, probably 50, 60 species of fruit trees between this little valley and up at the building where we uh, did the classes and, um, and such. We were using cahoon palm leaves to shade these garden beds because of that hot tropical sun. And there's a little spring-fed stream, and I had uh, uh, gravity feed water systems to that and to uh, halfway up the slope um, to uh, basically a, a laundry area and then a tank that came back down and outdoor showers and whatnot, but just working with what you have. So this is kind of a little bit hard to tell here, but this is going down on a slope, and you have these rows of these leguminous trees, and there's another row, and then you have you know, cassava and banana and probably 30, 40 different other species mixed in here. And the idea is you're planting on a contour, uh, just going in with a machete and putting uh, these leguminous tree seeds into that little cut in the rainy season, and they come up as a kind of a wall of trees, and you can thin them and do what you want. Uh, and but you're creating shade and nitrogen in the dry, hot part of the year for these, while these are getting established, the crops are getting established between them, giving them some shade. And then when the rainy season starts, you can come in there and cut them maybe a foot off the ground, uh, and then I would like leave one tree every 10 feet or so, and then girdle it and plant a yam or a chayote or some kind of a climber that would climb up the, the dead treetop using it as structure. And then all you know around where the cuts were and the new sprouts would come up. So you keep managing for new sprouts, coppicing. And so you can pinch off all but one and have firewood, or you can leave four for bean poles, and whatever you want to do. Then you take a bunch of those tops you've cut and weave them in between the stumps, and you've got a, basically a living basket that's catching soil coming down slope as a, as a self-repairing terrace, kind of self. It takes some work. Um, anyway, that was one of the strategies to try to get away from uh, burning. Um, there's, a, there's a whole conversation about fire, and um, I don't know if this is, maybe I'll get into that in a minute. Um, so this is an example of a, of a sugar cane press that's made from probably, let's see, this is Sweetia panamensis, really hard heartwood and, and um, for the gears, and two people turn this. There's probably seven different species of wood in this for the tool, and it's made with a machete. So it's like not only does the machete do all this other work, but it makes the other tools, the ladders, the um, whatever else you need. So it's a really amazed me how, I mean, it was a level of autonomy that I just had never seen in this country by a long shot. Uh, so we built this lodge after years of using these little camps and things for students, and groups were getting bigger, and we needed uh, you know, a, a bigger kitchen and, and places for people to stay. And so built this building with um, kind of three levels of technology. We, we hauled all the sand and cement upriver and, and mixed it by hand, the cement, and, and put it in the post because there's termites. So we wanted to get at least one, uh, one level up above the termite level and poured the cement floors all by hand. And then we did uh, basically a framed second floor. And then this top part was unchanged in thousands of years. Uh, all the species we used to thatch it and the vines to tie it and uh, the time of the moon that they need to be cut and all that, and it matters. <laughs> you know, if, if anybody who thinks that that's hokey, I mean, if, if you're going to build, do the work to build a, a roof and it lasts two years instead of ten, um, you're going to learn in a hurry what works and, and why it works. I'm not 100% sure but other than possible fluctuations in sugar levels and, and desirability by insects and things like that. But uh, it was really interesting watching this get built, kind of like the, it being inside of a whale or something or a big giant basket. These are cahoon palm leaves. They're 20, 30 feet long. That's what we're shading the, the garden beds with. Um, but pretty much everything um, from the land, you know. So it's, it basically put these training wheels on my mind about how to think about things post petroleum and you know what, what we need to be prepared to do because this really our longest history as hunter gatherers and our, our existence was without petroleum. So we've just been in this little I wouldn't even call it a joy ride. It's more more like a misery ride. Um, but uh, I think that one way or the other. Not saying we have to go like just hand tools super primitive on everything. I, I'm looking at a lot of technology in a sense of, um, give you a couple examples. So 
I, I think we need to use tech, technology a lot like you have to steer into a skid when you go out of control on the ice, right? You know, we have to use it to get out of where we're at. Uh, you can't just go cold turkey, or, or maybe say another analogy would be swimming against a riptide. You, know, you kind of got to go with it and go at an angle to get back to shore. And so uh, another example I would use is that, you know, we're using, uh, I'm, I'm also working with uh, an organization called the Bionutrient Food Association and setting up chapters around the country and putting together mineral depots and such. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But one of the things we, um, we're using are refractometers to look at um, the uh, d total dissolved solids in the plant to look at the, the health of that plant and the nutrient density in a crude way, but it still holds up in terms of predicting when which, which plants insects are going to be eating and which ones they're not based on the plant's own ability to, uh, to protect itself. It's an immune system, and the beauty of it is that those secondary compounds very often translate into our immune system and our nutrition, and so it's a, it's a very elegant um, relationship. But where I was going to go with this is that if you lay out a bunch of tomatoes on a table and you measure the BRICS readings on a bunch of them and you got, say, some threes and some sixes and some tens and some fourteens and, uh, and you taste them all, you pretty quickly are going to be able to taste the difference between the, the highest and the lowest and then you keep doing it you're going to then be able to calibrate your taste buds. So once you use that technology to, uh, like training wheels, once you can ride the bike, basically your own nervous system, most of technology to me is uh, we've exported our nervous system into technology and out of our own internal uh, nervous system. And so I think uh, a lot of it we can re, uh, recalibrate and, um, and reactivate. We clearly had abilities way beyond what we generally have now because we don't have to use it. I mean, if you put phosphorus on plants, they're going to be less likely to develop mycorrhizal associations because they don't have the motivation or nitrogen fixing abilities and so forth. So um, anyway, let's move. So this was a dugout canoe that we built from a blowdown mahogany or no, Spanish cedar, um, which is in the mahogany family. And you can see this is the rib of that same palm leaf split in half and used as a shaping guide for the ads work. Um, and we pulled this thing out of the jungle about a over a mile um, and uh, had a bottle of rum going around and <laughs> be pulling and pulling in the hot tropical sun and some joker would be sitting in the back of the, <laughs> boat, the, back of the boat waiting for somebody to see if they, uh, you saw them. Anybody know what this is? Yep. So cacao is like this amazing superfood, and um, this is after roasting it and peeling it. So it's been roasted. You can see the oils. It's 60% cocoa butter, uh, and it's just this phenomenal um, drink that, that we make. Um, not just drinks, but uh, it's interesting in the curriculum uh, to go through like 10 different stages to get to chocolate. You know, it's like every, everything you have down there is like that. You get a coconut falls off a tree and you got to peel it and you got to break it open and you shred it and you make, you know, you, you work it with water and you strain it and make coconut milk and you let it, ri let it rise overnight and the cream comes to the top and you use that with the chocolate and then you pan pollinated vanilla beans and uh, picking the vanilla and then you have these stingless bees, uh, the, these little tiny uh, native stingless bees that make a type of honey that's like right out of a Tolkien novel. And uh, uh, so you put all that together and you've invested so much of your life in it that the quality goes way up. Um, I didn't understand this too well until um, one winter I was in a, my little cabin, you know, I lived in originally like an eight by eight cabin or eight by 10 cabin. And um, I was in the middle of, a, middle of winter, big snow on the ground, had, um, you know, log in the stove, nice and comfortable looking out the window and pulled a can of peach, or a jar of peaches off the shelf that I had planted and watched it grow and, you know, all those years and then that, that one taste of peaches, you know, brought back all these thunderstorms and rainbows and this, that, and the other. And it was like, wow. And I realized at that moment that you could be a billionaire and you couldn't afford to buy one bite of those peaches because your own 
relationship with it wasn't there. Uh, and that's a whole level of quality that I don't think that we understand in our uh, economic system. This is coffee going through the different stages of fermentation. We took off the berries, we fermented them, dried them, and this is the, the second husk on it that you, this was the old system. We're using, beat in a mortar and pestle <laughs> made, made again out of just local wood and, um, and then winnowed and then roasted and ground and made into coffee. All right. So how's everybody doing in terms of breaks? Um, kind of shifting into a new mode here. Okay, you guys want to take like a 10 minute break? Okay. Yeah, that'd be good if it's a transitional subject. Sort of. Okay.